Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to today's worship service. We greet especially those of you worshiping here as guests of the congregation. Each and every day, our God gives us what we need for our bodies and souls. And each and every day, we have reason to give thanks to God. Our service today will focus on our giving of thanks to our gracious God. The order of service that will guide us is setting two. It begins on page 172 in the hymnal. It will also be projected on the screen. Our first hymn is number 597, Now Thank We All Our God. We ask God to bless our worship. Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Let us pray. Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. First scripture reading today is from the book of Genesis in the 8th chapter. We hear about Noah and his family exiting the ark and giving thanks to God. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land, came out of the ark one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm of the day is Psalm 107C. It is printed in your service folder, also projected on the screen. <laughs>
question is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and there we see how gratitude toward God shows itself in being generous and helping others. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. And for the gospel acclamation, we'll be using words from the God's Word section in the hymnal. Today's gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 17. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated for the singing of our next hymn, number 510, In Christ Alone.
mercy and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is the gospel lesson for today from Luke chapter 17. We hear the conclusion again. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Fellow grateful people of God, the service has a Thanksgiving Day feel to it, at least parts of it, at least to me. The gospel lesson for today is usually the gospel lesson, very often the gospel lesson on Thanksgiving Day. The opening hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, was a suggested hymn for this day, and that too has Thanksgiving Day written all over it. And I suppose if you were living in Canada, this would be very fine. Tomorrow is their Thanksgiving Day, the second Monday of October. But our national day of Thanksgiving is six weeks off or so. So are we jumping the gun with the opening hymn? Not really. Our new hymnal, if you look at the section headings, doesn't really have a Thanksgiving section. And so now thank we all our God is from the praise and adoration section. And maybe that relabeling will encourage more of its use beyond the fourth Thursday of November. And what about using the gospel lesson that's often for Thanksgiving Day and today? Well, it's a gospel lesson that's all about thanksgiving, praise to God. And that attitude is certainly not limited to one day out of the year. So, a gospel lesson and a hymn that's associated with Thanksgiving Day. We're using it today on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. To me, that tells us that we can look at every day of life with this attitude, another day, another Thanksgiving Day. We look at each day that's filled with blessings, and we look at each day as an opportunity to give thanks to God. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As Jesus traveled along, he saw and heard people who were standing at a distance to him, ten men. These men had leprosy, a skin disease. These men were relegated, really, to a slow death. There was no cure for their condition. And so they stood at a distance. The solution, since there was no cure, was to banish these people to a life of isolation. Talk about social distancing. These people were confined, limited to a leper colony. These people were considered ceremonially unclean. And so they really had to keep their distance from other Jews who were clean, who didn't have this kind of condition. And if they came anywhere near people who were clean, they had to alert those people to their condition by calling out, unclean, unclean, warning people that they were near. This was a tough life. These people had to fend for themselves somehow. And they being a pretty different group. Nine Jews, one Samaritan. If life had been going differently, if these men had been healthy, they would not have been hanging around like this. Just because Jews and Samaritans were like oil and water, they didn't mix. And their rivalry goes back some 700 years. When the Assyrians deported the ten northern tribes, they brought in other people to take care of the land. Those people became known as Samaritans. And they were the new kids on the block, even 700 years later during Jesus' time. But now when these 10 people, nine Jews and one Samaritan, had a common affliction, they put aside their old rivalries and they tried to survive together. These men stood at a distance, they cried out, 
for Jesus' help. And they received it in a pretty low-key way. The way in which they received healing for their leprosy is reminiscent of Naaman in the Old Testament. Naaman was the commander of the army in Syria. He too had leprosy. He too could do nothing about it. He too was looking at a slow, painful, agonizing death. But he knew someone in his household who knew the prophet Elijah. And this person said, go see Elisha. He'll help you. So he went to see Elisha. And then Elisha said, the cure for your leprosy is to go into the Jordan River, wash yourself seven times, and you'll be clean. You'll be healed. Go into the water seven times, you'll be healed. Naaman's reaction to that was this. I thought that he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. Miracles have to be showy, right? There's got to be a lot of stuff going on? No, not at all. The miracle for Naaman, very low-key, and for these ten people, too, their cure for leprosy was in a similarly less than spectacular way. Jesus simply said, go show yourselves to the priests. That's it? Yes, leave here, go to the priests in Jerusalem. But why do that? Well, under the Old Testament ceremonial laws, the priests served as the local health department officials. They were the ones who pronounced people clean or unclean. They actually inspected skin diseases and then again said, you were clean, good to go, you were unclean, and you needed to stay out of society. So with that instruction, these ten men went to the priests in Jerusalem, and on their way, they were healed. What a blessing. Do you think that we can relate to these ten men? Certainly. Not with the health condition that they had, but we shared with them a problem that was much, much worse than leprosy, the condition of sin. That, too, left untreated, would lead to not just an earthly death, but eternal death. And that condition, too, was out of our hands as far as the solution. Nothing we could do. But then Jesus, God's Son, comes into the world to rescue us from that condition. And he rescued us not by giving us instructions to go and see priests, but he rescued us from that condition by serving as the high priest, sacrificing himself, sacrificing his perfect, holy, innocent life on the cross. He sacrificed himself, the book of Hebrews says, once and for all. He made one sacrifice, unlike the daily priest and the sacrifices that went on. One sacrifice for all. And that sacrifice brought forgiveness. Forgiveness for our sinful nature, for who we are by nature. Forgiveness for the sins that we commit each and every day. That sacrifice brought life. Spiritual life. Eternal life. And through God and through his word, we enjoy that life and forgiveness every day. When Martin Luther explained the third article of the Apostles' Creed, he explained that one of the blessings of being Christians, being children of God, being part of the Holy Christian Church is this, that in this Christian church, the Holy Spirit daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. Like clockwork, God comes to us through word, through the sacrament, and says, you're forgiven. I've forgiven you all your sins. One person wrote this. He said, love letters are the campaign promises of the heart. I had to think that through a little bit, too. Love letters are the campaign promises of the heart. 
What do candidates do during campaign season? They make a lot of promises. They promise this, they promise that. What happens if they get elected into office? Do they keep every single promise? Do promises fall through? Do they fall apart? We know how that can go. Love letters are the campaign promises of the heart. When people are dating, love letters can be written. Text messages, spoken words, good appearances are made, promises are made. But what can happen when that relationship gets to the next stage? Similarly, promises can fall apart. Promises cannot be kept. But how different it is with God's love letters to us. That's basically what the Bible is, love letters to us. God's promises don't fall apart. God keeps his promises. Each and every day, he gives us the news of the forgiveness of sins. The book of Lamentations says, his compassions never fail, they are new every morning. Every morning we wake to the realization that we are God's children through faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven, and each night we can put our heads on the pillow knowing that we are forgiven children of God. The coming and going of each day reminds us of God's blessings. And the blessings of each day remind us that we have opportunities for giving thanks to God. At some point when these ten lepers walked away from Jesus and headed toward Jerusalem, at some point they recognized that things were different. They could tell by looking at themselves, by looking at each other, and it wasn't just that their complexion was getting clearer and better. No, they were healed. Can you imagine their reaction? Jumping for joy, yelling out, ten men talking at once. What a day that must have been for them. One of the ten did an about face and came back to Jesus. He came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. One person out of the ten came back to thank Jesus, and he was the most unlikely in that group. Jesus noted that. Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? The foreigner, the outsider, the one that people despise, he was the one who came back and thanked. The other nine, the Jews, the ones for whom Jesus came first into the world, received his blessings but went on their merry way and didn't thank Jesus. easy to do, isn't it? Very easy to be on the receiving end of God's blessings and to fail to thank him like those nine men. Because it's easy to do that, our God has a message like this in the 103rd Psalm. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. When I was in grade school, I had a good lesson in remembering to give thanks. I was probably about 10 years old at the time, and a friend from church invited me to spend the night at his place with his family. So I did that. Next morning, my mom drove over to pick me up and take me home. We got into the car, she asked how everything went. I said it was good. She's ready to put the car into gear. Lever was up there at the time. Ready to put the car in gear, and then she asked, did you remember to thank them? No was the only word I could get out of my mouth. Well, a young man marched right up there and thanked them. Imagine the awkwardness, the embarrassment of a 10-year-old kid going back up that long, long, long sidewalk to the door, ringing the bell, hearing the question of your friend's mom, did you forget something? 
Yeah, I forgot to thank you. Well, I can attribute that and my mom's instruction to a lifelong lesson. I'm pretty quick today to thank anybody for anything. But saying thank you requires effort. It really does. And saying, saying thank you to God requires effort. Let me, let me share another memory with you. When we hit lows in life, we can do a couple different things, I think, two, two different directions. We can draw closer to God, we can distance ourselves from God. And when there are low points in ministry, the same thing can happen. We can draw closer to God, or we can distance ourselves from Him. So at one low point in ministry years ago, I decided to do something different in my prayer life. I decided that at the end of the day, before I nodded off, I would try to replay the events of the day and try to single out and find at least one thing that happened for which I could thank God. And I have to say, on some of those days, I had to replay and replay to find that one thing that I could remember that stood out for which I would thank God. But it was a good exercise. And I have to say, I have not carried it out consistently, but I encourage you to do that. At the end of the day, at the end of this day, say, thank you, Lord, for, and then complete that sentence. I know that about 10.30 tonight, I'm going to be saying, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity of serving as your vacancy pastor. So, we replay events in life, and we find reasons for thanksgiving. After the Samaritan fell on his knees to thank Jesus, after Jesus talked about the other nine people who were healed who weren't there, he dismissed the Samaritan with these words, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Those are words that could use some explaining. The worst possible way of understanding them would be to give the credit to this man for the healing that he needed. As in, he had such great faith that that's why Jesus healed him. And you know that the opposite goes like this, the message of the televangelist. You still have this problem in your life because you don't believe enough. You have to believe harder. That's not how it goes. The power to heal, the power to forgive is in the Lord's hands. He's the one who does that. Faith is the conduit that brings the Lord's forgiving, powerful love into our lives. And it's not the amount of faith, it's not the level of faith, it is faith, period. God-given, spirit-worked faith. And so Jesus told this man, the reason you are healed is because you took me at my word. It was the faith that God gave you that enabled you to receive this blessing and more blessing than that. So, another day, another Thanksgiving day. It's not just my idea. I actually got the idea from the Lord, and he passed that idea along in the Bible. He led the psalm writer to say, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So happy Thanksgiving Day. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we respond to God's word by confessing our Christian faith. We use today the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the reception of our new members. Your brother and sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as, by, as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. Through membership, you will now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here today to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? Then answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and his empty promises? Then answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Then answer, I do. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Then answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you come to know it from your course of instruction, is faithful and true to the word of God? Then answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. And finally, do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful to the truth of God's word and sacrament, and in faith and action to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as long as you live? Then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Nancy Hatton and Gary Hatton. Since it is God who works, enables us to will and to do of his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these new members, that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Therefore, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these individuals, Gary and Nancy, to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name. Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Your church invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood in the future. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. Receive the sacrament thankfully and often. The Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Amen. You may depart in peace. And we'll stand for the response of prayer.
Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Work with us so that we believe and live the word we have Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move with us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel will be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and comes to trust in you. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Pour out your special blessing on Larry Watts, who is hospitalized. Bless all that is being done to diagnose and treat Larry's condition. Reassure him and his family that he is in good hands because he is in your hands. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distress to your love in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with the next hymn, number 520, over a thousand tongues.
holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of every life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join also in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn, number 604, When All Your Mercies, O My God. I'll be watching with interest definitely to see how the calling process goes, praying for that. I will contact the individual that you call, definitely. I'll put an encouraging word. I'll offer to fill in a vacation for him if he needs that kind of help. So that's the idea. I'm guessing Dan has an announcement. Go ahead. Yeah, so just a couple things. Um, Apologies for not getting this out sooner, but there is a sign-up sheet now in the entryway for our Food and Faith Dinner, which is going to be uh, this Friday. Um, it's something we did pre-COVID and then obviously had to, had to stop it. Just um, ways to try to get together as a, as a church family. So there'll be a, a meal, a short Bible study, about 15, 20 minutes or so after the dinner, and then there'll be a, a monthly activity. Um, and this month we're going to do pumpkin carving. And so just a an opportunity for us to intentionally gather once a month. It's going to be the second Friday of each month um, to spend time together as a church family growing in faith and enjoying fellowship time together. So there's a sign-up sheet out in the entryway if you'd like to join us for that. 
I'd love to have you, or you can ask me. Um, and then also today, as a professor mentioned, it's last Sunday, there will be a meal uh, after second service, so I know you're here for first service, but feel free to, to come back and, and join us for that, uh, to thank him and celebrate his, uh, his service with us throughout the summer and into the fall. Very good, thank you. And Bible class will take place right after this downstairs. I invite you to come to that. We're looking at a couple of questions on church and ministry. That's the topic today. So I think with that, I'll just wish you a good day. God's blessings to you all.